Hi, my name is Dr. Dirk Lee. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pedro Bergiano. Uh, Dr. Bergiano is the chair of the G-Spine 4 department of the Galeazzi Orthopedic Hospital in Milan. He's also a clinical professor, postgraduate master program in neurosurgery at the University of Turin and clinical professor of the res residency program in orthopedics at the University of Milan, and also the deputy editor of European Spine Journal and the author and co-author of over 150 scientific articles. Welcome, Dr. Bergiano. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for inviting me. Okay. Now, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, scoliosis today and uh, spine surgery, of course, and um, I want to start off basically with um, the anterior approach to surgery. It seems that in the US and North America, it's kind of fallen out of fashion over the last 20 years or so, where with posterior fusion and pedicle screws, that's been basically the approach. But in Europe, anterior approach seems to be much more common. Is that the case? And what and can you tell us a little bit about your expertise in that in that area? Yeah, actually, you are right. In Europe, there have been some surgeons who have kept their indications for anterior fusion surgery in scoliosis high. My experience is a little bit different because my background on scoliosis treatment in regarding uh, pediatrics and adolescents has been mostly posterior. Uh, on the other side, I, I have been uh, pushing the edges and helping the medical community to develop new strategies for the use of minimally invasive anterior approaches for adult deformity. So uh, you could tell that I have both the experience of treating uh, scoliosis, children with scoliosis, and I have developed a long, a long experience treating uh, the spine by an anterior approach. That will be for fracture, for uh, deformity, mainly in adults, for degenerative diseases. And we have been really expanding the indications for that. And as a consequence, uh, as many times happen, you find new grounds in the intersection between your previous experiences. So for me, it came very natural to do a small step from my experience in anterior approaching the spine and in treating anteriorly the spine to use this as a tool for uh, non-fusion techniques for adolescents. That is my experience. Very good. Now, since that's a very good uh, transition into non-fusion techniques, um, when was your first exposure to uh, tethering BPT ASC, and why did you decide to start performing that particular type of surgery? Yeah, th this is a question that I love to answer to because my first experience or my first knowledge about uh, anterior techniques with non fusion, like tethering, uh, came from the like uh, 1915, 1914, and I was like skeptical about these techniques at the beginning. I learned from my, from, my, from my mentors not to be the first one doing things and not to be the last one implementing them. And I think it's a good advice, though the perfect balance between that is sometimes difficult to find. And so I was following the topic because I thought that if actually treating the, the uh, adolescent scoliosis or children's scoliosis with non-fusion techniques uh, was effective, it would be really a game changer. So that was my first interest. Then I was following publications. I was following uh, Congress uh, symposia and Congress sessions. And finally, I like in in uh, 1917, I got convinced that I had to give this a chance and to learn more about this. And I spent some time, I traveled to, to the States, and I spent some time with doctors Daryl Antonacci and Randall Betts, uh, because I wanted to see with, with my own eyes what's, what was the, 
what was going on on this. And I think that getting them, getting it from some of the surgeons that at that moment had the largest experience was the best way to go for it. So I spent some time there. I spent time in the operating room, uh, seeing real patients, how they solve uh, these cases. And I spent also some time uh, in the clinics. Uh, I, I had the chance to directly interact with the patients, even not in the presence of, of the surgeons, which was very good because I could have candid explanations or, of, or about their feelings and their experiences and, and how they, they w did this, this, this trip through treatment of scoliosis. And at the end of that, uh, of that visit, I got convinced that uh, I would give my children if they had scoliosis, the chance to have a non-fusion technique. And that's the reason why I started doing this. So I, I, I think my first case, and I invited uh, Daryl Antonacci to visit our hospital for the first case to have like a, uh, like a, a, an airbag in case of, of problems. Uh, in the first case we did in January, 1918, and since then, we have been doing regularly cases, not a huge volume because our practice is not concentrated only in pediatrics and also because there are some cost constraints in, in Italy for using this technique. But we have been doing steadily these, these cases with a good satisfaction and, and very good perception of the outcome. Uh, from what you learned with uh, Dr. Antonacci and Dr. Betts, what about what is it about uh, VBT and ASC that made sense to you? Yeah, uh, you mean what is the difference, or what makes sense of, of it? Why why was it attractive? Yeah, well, it's attractive because of course you want uh, you want to correct you want to fix the pathology, but keep the function. And it's true that a uh, classical scoliosis treatment uh, gives very good functional results. Now, being, being a surgeon who takes a lot of cases of revision and a lot of cases of adult deformity, and of course, adult deformity revisions, I'm seeing also adults who were treated with fusion in their teen age, and now they are 50 or 60 and have uh, failure of the distal disc and they, they need revision, that doesn't mean that it has been an unsuccessful surgery because it has been working well for 40 or maybe 50 years, but you, you have a question mark. And I think that one explanation that uh, uh, Darryl and Randy used to explain the difference to their patients is that, of course, if you have a fusion from T5 to L3, you can swim and you can do some sports and you can play volleyball and you can use the bicycle. You can do a lot of things and some gyms. But if you want to be a, a, a swimming at a competition level and you have to turn at the end of the pool or if you are involved in judo activity or you are involved in, 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 uh, in extensive uh, uh, exertional activity, of course, uh, not having a fusion is an advantage functionally. And the other thing that I have found is that in medicine, uh, the, we don't have certainness of what is going to happen with every technique. And sometimes to get the solid data that tell you what is better and what is not takes uh, decades or never comes. For example, a very popular treatment for uh, for a femoral fracture, which is the Kuncher nail, is very effective, but we don't have a randomized clinical trial that tells us that it is the good treatment, but, but we use that. So I, what, what I think is that what I have discovered in this uh, visit is that patients come with their preferences sometimes. And for some patients having not having a fusion even when it is a little bit against the odds, makes a sense. And being able to help them with this can make a sense. Of course, informing well them 
trying to do a good educational work to explain them what is the upsides and the downsides of their preference. And sometimes you get to convince them to do the opposite uh, treatment, or sometimes you realize that you that they are right and that their preference is a, a good idea. Yes, the patient input is paramount, of course. Um, we can go back to um, diff trying to differentiate between uh, DBT and ASC. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, well, it's, I don't think it's an universally accepted difference because ASC is a, probably an improper term. Any anterior technique for correcting scoliosis is ASC, but the way that uh, Antonacci and Best have been popularizing it uh, means anterior scoliosis, scoliosis correction with motion preservation. So what is the difference between this ASC and VPT? Basically, it's the target patient. When you use VPT, when you expect growth modeling of the shape of the spine, so you constrain the, the convexity of the spine, expecting that the growth of the concavity uh, straightens up the curve. You do some correction with the surgery, and then the patient is going to correct uh, themselves. And of course, this needs a patient with a potential growth of the spine remaining. Uh, that is the first uh, constraint. The second constraint is the, is the magnitude of the curve. If you have a curve which is over 65 degrees or even 60, even if the patient is still immature, probably this uh, VPT technique cannot or is, is less likely to hit the target. So what happens when you have a mature patient who is not going to grow and use growth modeling to straighten up the, the curve or with it, when the patient has a more severe curve, even if they are if they are still immature. There comes the idea of doing ASC. ASC means uh, releasing the spine to allow for more correction. And you get that by ligament release, by annulus uh, release, or by disc release. The second thing is not using thoracoscopy, but using mini thoracotomy. Because if you open the chest cavity, you can use tools to increase the correction. If you, do, if you use thoracoscopy, the, the rib cage is going to limit the uh, ability to use the levers on the screws to do the correction. And the third thing is to try to increase the, res the resistance of the implant. Because when the patient is mature, you expect that for the rest of their life or for a longer part of, of their life, the implant is going to be working. Though I would also expect in, in a mature patient in their teen age uh, that some ligament relaxation happens. And so it releases the, the, the stress from the material. But uh, for this reason in ASC, usually we use, we use a double uh, cord and, and two screws in, in each uh, vertebra to increase the resistance of, of the of the correction. That, that is the, the main differences between these two, two techniques. Okay. Perhaps we can talk a little bit more about the um, ASC um, uh, procedure. Now, um, with respect to, to the disc release, disc release seems to be a bit of a controversy among surgeons in terms of yeah. if you um, uh, injure the disc, perhaps that causes faster degeneration and maybe autofusion in the future. Do you have a perspective on that? I, I don't have, uh, I don't have, uh, un, uh, how do you say, a gold data to, to discuss this and no one has. Mm -hmm. We know that, uh, for example, we have some studies that show that in adults, when you use a needle into the disc, that needle into the disc can uh, can uh, start this degeneration. So uh, is it legitimate to even open the disc? That's a big question mark. When we release the disc, even with the slightest uh, release technique, there is a potential of changing the biology of the disc. Uh, that's a, 
a, an impression of mine. It's not any data, but I think that when you make an aggression to a disc in the in the younger age of patients, uh, they could very slowly degenerate, but being silent, it can happen. And in fact, we see some patients who have been treated with anterior fusion and they have degeneration of the adjacent disc without any symptoms. So degeneration, not causing any symptoms can happen even for a very long time. The second uh, possibility is that there happens a kind of uh, uh, ankylosis. Ankylosis means some loss of motion in the disc that has had the aggression. And as a result of this, uh, reduction of motion, it becomes more stable. Well, that would seem to be uh, in contrast with the with the uh, desire to keep the motion of the spine by doing these techniques. But in, in one of the first congresses I was uh, participating in a discussion of, of this, uh, one delegate uh, raised a hand and said, you know, if you do motion preservation, but then you open the disc and it's going to fuse, then it is not motion preservation. And another delegate answered what I was thinking. Well, if you have a scoliosis uh, that, that takes like nine vertebrae and you uh, obtain a good correction, keeping the motion in all the discs, but three, that's something I would buy doing a selective fusion. So I don't think that this release is a scandal. I don't think it's a scandal. Of course, we should be very attentive to this and learn how it behaves over time. Another important thing about this release is that uh, it, it, it's, it's not the same where you do the this release. I think that uh, doing a disc release is quite acceptable in the middle of the thoracic spine and actually is where it's usually done. Probably I would not like to do these releases in the lumbar spine where it's more critical. Because I know from a parent's perspective, uh, if you're going, um, you know, parents would prefer not to fuse to keep the spine if some with some flexibility. Um, and with the some of the controversy of the disc release, patients are going, well, if, if I do ASC and I release discs, uh, how is that any worse than doing a fusion in that same area? Is that correct logic or is, the, is, that, is that correct thinking? Yeah, I, I think that there is no, no definitive answer to this. But let me give you some approach to the problem. So if you, uh, of course, doing a deformity correction, for example, a thoracic curve uh, correction with uh, two or three of these releases, if they fuse, you are not going to feel a loss of function due to that. You are not going to perceive that. And I see this every day. Also, when I uh, see my patients with two or three level fusions in the adult life, they don't perceive a difference of motion. So it is something you are not going to see. Having a, this degeneration that becomes painful, I think that's the worst possible scenario. I don't think, or we don't see that it is happening, but of course we don't have 20 years of follow-up in these cases. But I can tell you that if that was the case, we have the methods to fix that problem. You have a, a diseased disc and it's painful fusion surgery of those discs. Usually it's very effective and that's something that most of the spine surgeons can do. Uh, I don't see that that's a huge problem. That I discuss this with my patients that is, is something that can happen, of course. But there's another point. The choice between doing or not doing the disc release is not really a choice. So it depends on what you are treating. If you are treating an immature patient, very flexible, 55 degree uh, thoracic curve, you don't need to do any disc release. Now, if you have a 80 degree thoracic curve that you are mature or immature, or if you have a mature patient who has a, 70, a 65 degree thoracic curve, if you don't use these releases in two or three levels, you don't get the correction. 
So the real point is not if I have the choice of doing the, the dish release, but is how can I technically obtain the correction? So what for me it's very easy because if a patient has a big concern against this release and the correction of the curve needs that, I tell them do a fusion. Don't do a, a motion preservation technique. That solves most of the controversy. So for ASC and mature spines, I think one concern is that if uh, a tether breaks, since there's no bone growth modulation in mature spines, that what's, what's going to stop the curve from regressing completely? Yeah. Well, I think that there are some things that are going to, to stop the curve from progressing. That is not going to happen in every case. So we see some, uh, in, in, in our cases or in other surgeons' cases, we see uh, road breakages that need a revision and some that don't need it. What are the, the, the uh, events that fight against the need of revision? The first one is the correction of the rest of the curve. So if you have a strong curve and you change the shape, you change the uh, lateral flexion or lateral bending moment on that curve. If you correct most of the curve, but then you have a breakage in one point, the coronal bending moment is not going to be that high. So that's something which is protecting somewhat against the recurrency or the severe recurrency of the curve. The second thing is that uh, when you put under tension the ligaments, they actually release a little bit. So surprisingly, when or not surprisingly, when you we have to treat a very severe deformity, and I mean some congenital or some some very bad curves of the spine, uh, like a 120 degree scoliosis, what you do is putting them in traction. You put them in traction because after a couple of weeks or, or four weeks, you do the correction and you don't need so much force to do the correction. And that's because the soft tissue yields and the ligament releases a little bit. The second thing, I remember the first case I saw in, in, in Antonacci and Beth's clinic, and they were the first case I saw was a revision case. It was a girl with a 90 degree thoracic curve who had a, a correction to like 35, then the tether broke and she went back to 45 and she had revision. The interesting thing is that whilst in the first uh, surgery, the correction was possible only to 35, in the second one, with the same effort, the surgeons were able to correct, to correct that to 25 degrees. So I think that something happens also in soft tissue. It doesn't have in bone, of course. You don't have bone remodeling, but you have some soft tissue really, really is very likely. And we have examples of that also in limb surgery when you treat uh, tendons and we, we do limb lengthening. Sometimes you can also get lengthening of the soft tissue if you uh, use external forces to do it correctly. Again, this is not direct evidence, but it's uh, observations that add some information to to this perspective. Dr. Prigiano, um I believe you have a, uh, maybe a case or two that you can present about the, the yeah, of procedures. Course. Okay, I'd love to see that. Yeah. So I have, uh, I have prepared uh, some uh, small case presentation for you to see some examples of, on how it works in, in our department. I have brought some very mild cases uh, with both mature and immature uh, patients. Some have complete follow-up in this slideshow, but I didn't bring complete follow-up for all of them just to avoid boring you. Recently, here you can see this uh, relative mature, relatively mature patient. She has a uh, Sanders 5. 14 years old, Fraser 2, and she came with a 49 degree main thoracic curve. The, the lumbar curve was secondary. And in this case, though, the flexibility of the curve didn't seem to be very, 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 very uh, impressive. We got a very nice correction with a couple of these release. 
at the at the apex of the curve. You see here the fixation has been only of the cob angle, and the uh, lumbar curve has corrected spontaneously to 20 degrees. This only immediately post top, but I think it gives a very good idea on how it can be very effective or mild deformities of the spine. And for me, in this case, the most interesting thing is what you see on the right, on the right uh, 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 image. You see how the kyphosis, that means the anterior flexion of the thoracic spine, that is what is giving space for the lungs to inflate, is increased in these in these cases. And probably this release is helping also to increase the thoracic kyphosis a little bit. So again, this is a very interesting point because as one of my mentors told me many years ago, uh, making lordosis appearing in hypolordotic scoliosis cases is important and is one of the most difficult things to do with posterior surgery. And here it happens, of course, with modern techniques, high density of pedicle screw implants and very hard rods, you can manipulate the spine and get kyphosis, but the way you do it with anterior surgery is very impressive with very limited force on that. And you can see that in the, also in the measurements. Uh, this is another case, again, a mild curve with a coronal uh, trunk shift. She has a 50 degree uh, curve in the thoracic spine, 22 in the lumbar, and it gets corrected to 20 and 9, again, with a very good restoration of the thoracic kyphosis that started at 30 degrees and became 45 degrees, which is much more in line with the shape of the pelvis of this patient. This is a mature patient. She is a, a 16, Brister was 4 to 5, uh, 4, and Sanders was 6. The stage of Sanders was 6 in this case. This is another case. It's a double curve. This is again a, a mature patient. Most of my patients are mature, and that's due to the idiosyncrasy of the Italian uh, patients. Many of them delay the treatment, and when they show up for treatment, they are already mature. Here you can see she has a main lumbar curve. Without any uh, disc release, she corrected from 51 to 11 degrees, and the thoracic curve was also treated because it was structural and corrected very nicely to six degrees. This is the immediate uh, postoperative image. Here there is a similar case. As you can see, this is a, a girl who has a, a linky five a curve. That means that the lumbar uh, deformity is more severe than the thoracic one. And again, the lumbar curve corrects very nicely with this ASC without doing any disrelease. Really. So it's only a double row of screws and double cord in, on both on both curves. This was a 16-year-old uh, girl, again, with Sanders 8. That means it's complete uh, growth of the spine. And here you can see that a couple of years of follow-up, the same, the same girl. She has a leg length discrepancy that has caused this strange um, shape of the, of the pelvis. She is very happy also, functionally is doing very well. Is a black belt of karate and has been practicing after the surgery. So this is the kind of, of patient that I think is at, at one year of follow-up. This is the kind of patient that I believe that benefits more from a non-fusion technique. These patients who are involved in very active uh, sports uh, at the competition level. So, uh, again, this is a, a double curve, again, a link a six, so she has a, the, the most severe curve is the lumbar one. And you can see, again, she is a mature with the research tree, 13 years of age, 64 degrees that goes in the lumbar spine to, to 10. Typically, the lumbar spine corrects much better than the thoracic curve, even without any of these releases, as you can see here. And again, the thoracic profile, she had a hypokyphosis, was 24 degrees of kyphosis, which is a little bit scarce for her uh, sagittal shape. And now after surgery, she's 
31 degrees. This may be the only patient of, of, of those that I have treated where we detected a cord break. Uh, as you can see by this arrow, these two screws have spread a little bit, but she doesn't have any symptoms. The increase of the deformity is not uh, very visible. It's like four, five degrees more, and we don't see a, a, the need for any revision in this case. And a couple of much more, much tougher cases. This is a, a girl with a very complicated history. She had the a, a tethering of the spinal cord when she was very young, and she had a very severe curve, very mature. She had a standards two or three. Uh, when he, she came to my clinic first, she had a 70 degree uh, deformity in the thoracic spine. The last thoracic uh, X-ray we did before surgery, and she had to wait for surgery due to the to the COVID stop of elective activity. In some months, she progressed from 75 degrees to 90 or 92, so it was a very severe. In the in the last standing X-ray, it was 82 before the surgery, and she progressed again after that. You can see here she needed aggressive discectomies to make this correction. So she had aggressive release at, at uh, three discs in the in the apex of the thoracic spine. And this is the correction of the spine. And this is the one year follow up. I see some increase of the K, of the thoracic kyphosis. And this is something that can happen when you need this uh, uh, aggressive release of the thoracic spine in very mature patients. So it, it it is one of the things that you, we have to look at when we treat these patients. And this is another tough case. And interestingly, this, this is the first case we treated in, in, 19, in, 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 uh, in 2018. It was a girl with a very severe trunk shift, uh, 86 degree thoracic curve. And after the surgery, she was corrected to uh, 20, 23 degrees after the after the correction. You can see also how the sagittal profile has improved by increasing the thoracic kyphosis, which is very good for the for breathing in these patients. And this uh, curiosity of this girl, like three months after the surgery, she was a very a very active athlete. This one year postoperatively. Incidentally, this uh, this girl abandoned the the competition in, in athletics after uh, one year or so after after surgery but not because of surgery because but because of change of personal interest and here you can see a couple of years postoperatively uh, how uh, this young lady has a very nice mobility of the spine and well she is having a very nice active life and is Super happy with the shape of the spine. This is a 2.5 years of stop follow up on this deformity. So I would say that the experience in, in adolescents is very good. Uh, what about adults? We don't have a large experience in adults, but we have some adults treated. And it is something that is still even more controversial. And here the discussion with the patient has been to has to be very thorough. But this is an example. She is an adult, but actually she is like a grown adolescent, like a grown mature adolescent. She is 28 years old, very flexible yet. And you can see how the treatment with an ASC uh, method yielded a, a very nice correction of both the thoracic and the lumbar spine. Uh, with discectomies or these releases only in the apex of the thoracic spine. Here you can see. This is uh, the last case I wanted to share with you because it's uh, an ugly case to see, but it's a very interesting case to think about. This is a lady who has a syndromic deformity. You see that the shape of the spine is very odd. It has a lot of trunk shift. It has a very bad balance. And she also had a bilateral hip dysplasia. So she had bilateral hip replacement at the age of 20 or so. And when you, I 
I don't know if the the, uh, the public who is listening to this interview is aware of that, but when you have someone who has bilateral severe hip dysplasia, these people, even after replacement of the hip, have a very unstable walking. They, when they walk, they have this tilting of the pelvis. If you look at this x-ray, doing the a, a fusion surgery on this case would uh, mean to have a fusion from high thoracic, maybe T5 or T4, till the, uh, the L3 or probably L4. So in these patients, leaving three mobile discs with a tilting tilt, tilt pelvis at each step they make in their lives, and they are 24, it's a very tough decision. And I, I, I'm not sure I would be happy to uh, do a fusion on this case. And happily, this lady came to me with the clear idea that she needed non-fusion. So we did this. You see that the number has have improved very much. You see that the x-ray doesn't seem so much improved. The lady is super happy. She has much better control of the trunk position. She is much more stable when she's walking. And I'm very happy because she is not going to stress so much this or those three or four discs remaining mobile below a fusion. She has much more mobility to to work on in, for the rest of, of her life. So again, not every time the good x-ray or the not so nice x-ray is showing a bad result. This is one of the ugliest, apparently ugliest x-rays I have, but it's one of the most rewarding cases for me for now. So I, I think that this uh, collection of, of, of histories of uh, individuals or girls or boys with scoliosis is interesting to to see. Well, thanks so much for taking us through your through your cases. Absolutely uh, fascinating, uh, Dr. Rajano. I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know it took us a little time to organize, and I know things are very busy in Italy. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. I have a, a very good news because one of the reasons why it took so much and I was so busy, I couldn't take the time for doing this is because we have, or our hospital has been building a brand new state of the, heart, of the art hospital in Milan and we are opening in September. So the good news is that the next patients we will treat with fusion, non-fusion, anything will benefit from one of the nicest and most modern hospitals in Europe in the years to come. So that's that's the good side of this uh, delay. That's excellent news. That's a good reason to wait then. And uh, whenever I'm in Italy, you'll have to uh, give me a tour. Please, please come. It will be a pleasure. Thank you very much again. And we'll, we'll talk to you again. Thank you, Dr. Lee.